we have been excited for this meeting for quite some time. Uh, uh, our chance to uh, to uh, present what we've been learning and what we've been up to, and to get feedback that we um, that we're that we've been looking forward to. So, um, um, I'm Matt Wolfgram. My background is in anthropology. Um, I have a so I'm one of the research mentors on this team, um, and then also uh, I'm one of the one of the leaders of the. Uh, I, I kind of lead up the qualitative part of the internship study, the college internship study. So that's another uh, uh, big thing I'm a part of. And I'm, a, I've all, I'm also launching another uh, another one of these uh, kind of student engaged projects. Uh, that one's at NEIU with Muslim identified students. And so those are some of the things that I've been involved with that uh, um, on the Gates CCWT portfolio. And so Bailey, I think it's you take the, the next one. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm Bailey. Uh, we're going to just go through everybody on the team briefly and introduce you, introduce ourselves to you. Um, like I said, my name is Bailey Smolarek. Uh, I use the pronouns she, her, and hers. Um, my background is I was a ESL and Spanish teacher uh, before receiving my PhD in 2016 in uh, curriculum and instruction. Since then, I've been at CCWT, um, and I've been a part of the Pantau team as a research mentor since we began in 2018. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for your time today. My name is Mainengva. I am a uh, PhD student in the Educational Policy Studies program here at UW-Madison. Um, a lot of my work revolves around the educational experiences of students of color, um, and specifically I'm interested in how race, class, and gender intersect to inform the lives of students and their families, um, as well as the ways that minoritized students and their communities respond to or resist hegemonic forces I'm also particularly interested in um, participatory action research as a form of um, resistance um, and um, resilience as well. So. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Yang Zhang and my pronouns are she, her, hers, and noon. Um, I'm a first year graduate student at um, UW Madison in the Applied Masters of Science in Human Ecology. Um, and prior to that, I did my undergrad here as well um, in human development and family studies. Um, so my current interest right now is to think about um, forming like uh, inf merging informal learning spaces and learning spaces. So looking at community based spaces and implementing that um, in school spaces for um, youth of color. Hi everyone, my name is Lena Lee. I am from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I just graduated with a degree in psychology and a certificate in Asian American Studies with a Hmong American Studies emphasis. Um, throughout undergrad, I've been a member of the Hmong American Studies Committee and I've been part of the Fundal Research Team for two years now. Um, currently, I'm an intern at CCWT, um, continuing the Fundal Research Team um, on the Fundal Research Team. Um, and in the near future, I hope to attend grad school and work with underrepresented students um, in higher education. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Paku Zhang. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I also just recently graduated with, or uh, in my fifth year, double majoring in human development, family studies, and psychology. Um, in my undergraduate year, I also did activism work through being involved with the Hong American Studies Committee, and I was also on the Bandar Research Team for two years. Um, I am currently an intern with CCWT on the Bandar Research Team as well, and taking a year off to figure out kind of what I want to do as a career. Um, my interest is in psychology, specifically with trauma-informed care, and hopefully, probably doing research on suicide. Hi, everybody. My name is Ariana Tao. I am also a recent graduate at UW-Madison. I studied political science, sociology, with a certificate in Asian American studies and among American emphasis. Um, currently, right now, I am a research development and implementation specialist at the Office of Access, Inclusion, and Compliance at Madison's Division of Extension, and I was also part of the Hmong American Studies Committee. 
Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lisa Yang, and I use the pronouns she, her, new. Um, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and um, I am majoring in education studies and psychology. I joined on the HMASC team this year, and I'm also, this is my first year doing uh, research with the Bandao team, too. Um, and I also have an Asian AM uh, certificate with the uh, Hmong emphasis. Um, and then in my future, I am really tired of school, so I hope to just be uh, working with community members, um, hopefully like uh, after school and like being a writer as well, who writes like children's books and like my own experiences. Hello, my name is Pei Ying Moa. I use pronouns she, her, hers. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and currently I'm studying health promotion and health equity while working on my Asian American uh, with a Hmong emphasis certificate and a leadership certificate as well. I am also one of the undergraduate student research on the Bandal team, um, and this is also my first year as well. Uh, a career goal of mine is to hopefully one day be able to blend the sciences and remedies of health with the knowledge of Hmong culture and mannerism to give back to my community and not invalidate the beliefs and identities that they hold, but instead to add knowledge um, onto health to the community's cultural, religious, and medicinal practices. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Odyssey Zhang. I am a graduating senior. Uh, I'm originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, studying sociology with an Asian American Studies cert Certificate. Also a commit, uh, committee member of the Hmong Americans Studies Committee. And again, a student researcher on the team. Okay, so I'm gonna start us off uh, with an overview. Um, so as you know, last year through Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funding, um, CCWT was able to continue and expand upon our work investigating college internships and examining pathways for students of color from college to the workforce. Um, the work we're presenting today is one piece of a multi-sided ethnographic project examining college to career pathways for students of color at three colleges. Um, but the impetus for this multi-sided work is actually this particular study, which began in 2018 as a qualitative community-based participatory action research or CBPAR uh, partnership between CCWT and the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Hmong American Studies Committee um, to examine the educational experiences of Hmong American college students at UW-Madison by investigating institutional factors that influence the campus inclusion, educational success, and post-college transitions of uh, this minoritized population. And our presentation today will focus on the transformative power of community-based participatory action research, and will provide more information on the specific origins of the project, our research methodology, preliminary findings regarding career pathways for Hmong American undergrads, as well as next steps in our research. But first, we'd like to express um, our gratitude to you all at the Foundation for supporting our work. Um, because of the funding CCWT has received from the Gates Foundation, we've been able to expand and continue the study. During the first year of our study, we were able to interview 27 Hmong American undergraduate students, um, which is about 10% of all the Hmong American undergrads at UW-Madison, about their college experiences and pathways into the world of work. However, due to, to funding from your foundation, this academic year we were able to expand our sample by interviewing 36 current Hmong American undergraduate students, as well as 31 former students, including alumni and students who either dropped out or transferred, and four staff members who worked directly with Hmong American students for a total of, of 71 participants. Um, additionally, we were able to conduct numerous participant observations with a subsample of our participants and collect abundant um, artifact data pertaining to Hmong American students. And um, we were fortunate to actually complete our plan data collection before the, the COVID-19 crisis hit. But um, the current pandemic has really urged us to, to continue data collection remotely by conducting um, online interviews, online follow-up interviews with our participants to better understand how the current crisis is impacting their lives. Um, so far, we've conducted 17 interviews and we're planning to conduct more. 
Um, we're also in the midst of data analysis um, with 71 participants and observations and artifact data. We have quite a bit of, of data to go through, um, but we'll be presenting you a slice of our preliminary findings today. Um, and these preliminary findings document the role of institutional and sociocultural factors such as institutional gatekeeping procedures, professional and peer advising and social support, cultural and family expectations and campus cultures in students' discipline and program choices, sense of belonging on campus, job market preparation and general educational success. In addition to discussing these important preliminary findings, which offer insights on college and career pathways, as well as on mechanisms that can improve campus climate, student services, and institutional policies for students of color. Um, we'll also discuss some of the action components of our work, which is very important when you're doing CBPAR work. And this includes uh, policy advocacy for ethnic studies on college campuses, specifically Hmong studies um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, meetings with state legislators, uh, and coalition building with students and scholars. Um, and finally, we will conclude our time today with you by sharing our next steps and our hopes for future research. Um, but before we begin the presentation, we'd just like to offer you a brief update on the other two ethnographic sites. Uh, Dr. Ross Benbow, who was unable to be here today, is currently partnering with a professor and group of students at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater, which is about an hour from Madison, to investigate the college experiences and career pathways of African-American undergrads. And their study uses qualitative interviews with African-American students at Whitewater to better understand their experiences, not only as they move through this rural, predominantly white institution into the workforce, but also as they navigate academic and career pathways in a time of increasing educational and social upheaval that includes campus and residential hall closures, the switch to online education, and continued social distancing from friends, classmates and faculty mentors, and sickness and continued violence inflicted on Wisconsin's black communities. Additionally, um, Dr. Matt Wolfgram, who you met, is also conducting a study at Northeastern Illinois University in partnership with members of their Muslim American Student Association to investigate the college and career preparation experiences of Muslim American students with different racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds. The goals of the study are to identify the sociocultural and institutional factors that influence the success of Muslim American college students with special attention to religious minoritization, gender, other social dynamics within the Muslim community, and historical factors such as the post 9-11 war on terror and current COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm sure Matt can um, answer any questions that you have about that. But uh, now we'd like to turn to our Hmong American College Pantao study. Um, and I'd like to invite Pa Yang to begin our presentation by providing you all um, a little bit of background on how our research began. Hi, so the Hmong American Studies Committee collaborates with researchers from CCWT, a program within the WCER at UW-Madison. Our community-based participatory action research um, our partnership with Dr. Smorlark and Dr. Wolfgram began in the fall of 2018. Our research titled, Our Hmong American College Pandao examines the social, cultural, and institutional factors that influences the experience of Hmong American co college students at UW-Madison. Pandao translates into story cloth. It's a beautiful narrative tapestry in the Hmong culture and tradition that depicts stories of displacement, struggles, and resilience, which we use as a culturally appropriate metaphor for our research investigation about the experiences and struggle that Hmong American college students face in higher education today. The common spelling of our language is Hmong, um, capital H-M-O-N-G, which is an Americanized way based on the Romanized um, phonic alphabet. We seek to reclaim the representation of our own language, which we spell capital H, capital M-O-O-B. The capital H and capital M is intended to be more inclusive of both dominant dialects, Hmong Da and Hmong Green, also known as Hmong Lang. The OOB is kept in respect to our pronunciation and Hmong language. Uh, we feel 
that the spelling of capital H, capital M, O O B, Hmong, allows us to reclaim and embrace our Hmong identity, history, and heritage. Uh, partnering up with Dr. Smorlek and Dr. Wolfgram in the CB PAR project has given HMSC members the opportunity to conduct research within the Hmong American Student Committee community here on campus to make a bigger impact on not only the campus community, but hopefully the Hmong community of Madison as a whole. The research aims to add to our understanding of issues and inclusivity and belonging in higher education, as well as the role of inclusivity and belonging in educational success and post-college trajectories. By qualitatively examining the educational experiences of, of a particular minoritized population at a Midwestern, predominantly white institution, specifically we researched the experience of Hmong American college students at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In order to better understand issues of inclusivity and belonging for this minoritized population, to do this, we asked two, two key questions. What are the institutional factors influencing the college inclusion, educational success, and post-college transition of Hmong American college students at UW-Madison? And what are the potential mechanisms for improving these factors? Um, so prior to sharing our research, I'll give a brief background on Hmong American history. This history shows why Hmong Americans may require more support to access and to succeed in higher education, and that the experiences in higher education reproduce deep historical patterns of colonization and displacement. Although I'm comprising it in this little tidbit, understand that Hmong history is complex and plays out in many different forms. The Hmong are an ethnic group that has origins in China, but over time has encountered political displacement throughout Southeast Asia. Hmong history largely overlapped with US history during the Vietnam War, when the CIA recruited the Hmong and other groups living along the Vietnam-Lao border as guerrilla soldiers for the CIA's covert operation in 1964. After the United States withdrew their troops, groups like the Hmong had to flee to Thailand in search of refuge to escape the communist regime that was instated. Once registered as political asylum seekers with the United Nations, many Hmong families were resettled in countries such as the United States. Through three waves of refuge and immigration over the course of 45 years, approximately 300,000 Hmong people live in the United States today. The majority of Hmong Americans live in California, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, respectively. Wisconsin holds the third largest population of Hmong people in the United States. The Hmong communities represent the largest population of the largest Asian American ethnic group, and the third largest language group in the state. Despite their large presence, Hmong Americans have among the lowest educational attainment rate in the country. Um, in 2010, 38% of Hmong Americans in Wisconsin did not have a high school degree, compared to the 11% of Wisconsin's total population. Although more Hmong students are pursuing higher education and obtaining their college degrees, there is still a significant difference in degree holders when compared to the rest of Wisconsin population. At UW-Madison, Hmong American students in the state continue to face challenges in higher education. Through our research questions surrounding institutional factors that influence the campus inclusion, educational success, and post-college transitions of Hmong American college students, we found that the vast majority of Hmong American students are first-generation college students and are federal Pell Grant recipients. Furthermore, we see that Hmong American students predominantly rely on financial assistance and student support programs in order to be a part of the university. Hmong American students are also taking longer to graduate compared to their peers, as 46% of Hmong American un undergraduates graduated within six years across the UW system, compared to the rate at 62% for the total student population. The Hmong American Studies Committee was created at the University of Wisconsin-Madison as one of the responses to these issues. We represent a Hmong student activist group at UW-Madison whose mission is to establish a Hmong American Studies program in the institution. Our group focuses our work towards creating a physical space for Hmong students, working with the university to hire Hmong faculty and staff, bridging the Hmong students to the greater Hmong community in Madison, and creating academic curriculum that centers the experiences of Hmong Americans. My name will now be sharing on what community-based participatory action research is.
Um, so community-based participatory action research is a collaborative approach to research which involves academic researchers and members of the community. Um, so in this way, CBPAR pushes for research with people, not on people. Uh, community members are regarded as co-researchers rather than research participants or traditionally research subjects. Um, and they are given equal power to make decisions through every part of the research process, um, which includes um, developing the research questions and design, uh, data collection, analysis, and the distribution of findings. In this project, um, the community that we center are more American college students, hence the partnership with the More American um, Studies Committee. And furthermore, um, CBPAR requires a commitment to enacting socially just changes, uh, wherein findings from the research are used to inform activism, policy debates, and policy implementation. In the field of higher education, CBPAR offers an exciting and much needed research method that pr privileges the knowledge and experiences of college students from minoritized backgrounds. As both a research approach and a pedagogical tool, CBPAR empowers students to become critical inquirers of their lived experiences. It enables students to become producers of knowledge rather than just consumers of knowledge. In this way, CBPAR aligns with Brazilian educator Paulo Freire's concept of consciência sexual, or consciousness raising. In our work, um, we refer to this concept as building critical consciousness. Um, participation in CBPAR requires student researchers to interrogate issues of power and privilege in order to better understand how systems of power and oppression work. Uh, the goal here is to create a more just, um, well, to create more just equitable systems with this knowledge. Um, and in the Frarian tradition, we also contend that transformational growth from participating in CDPAR can only be achieved if actions are coupled with critical self-reflection. Uh, later on in this presentation, my colleagues will share what this process has looked like for them. So I'm gonna give a little overview of um, our research methods. Um, in the first phase of this study, during the 2018-2019 academic year, our research team interviewed and observed 27 enrolled Mo American students, as Bailey had shared earlier. Um, we are currently wrapping up the second phase of our study from this 2019-2020 academic year, uh, which includes 36 current students, 31 former students, uh, and that includes alumni, staff outs, and transfers, as well as four faculty, staff, and or administrators who work with Mo American students. To date, we have conducted a total of 98 interviews. In addition to these semi-structured interviews, we engaged in participation, or, um, excuse me, um, participant observations at events and workshops that Mo American students hosted or attended. Our team members also conducted observational field work in spaces that were frequented by more American students. The team also compiled artifacts to be analyzed such as photos, documents, and news articles. Our team members also kept auto ethnographic journals, which we are analyzing as data. Um, in a little bit here, Ying will be providing more information regarding the auto ethnographic journals. Um, for this year's data, we have completed a first round of segmented coding, which has already provided, a, provided us with a wealth of crucial insights regarding Mo American students' experiences um, at this predominantly white institution. While CBPAR has been used in a variety of social settings, including youth organizations, K-12 public schools, and prisons, it has not often been used in university settings. So I'm gonna hand it back to Ariana, who Ariana, who will be talking more about the capacity of CBPAR for student development in higher ed spaces. So as my Ning shared, CBPAR has a completely different role than traditional research. Oftentimes when students are researching at higher education institutions, the relationship is built off of the student signing on to a researcher's study and following their lead in the research process. Students' experiences with research are largely shaped by studies that they only have a small role in, a role that usually consists of data collection or plugging their findings into databases. 
Beyond those small pieces, students then get one opportunity to help present their research as, at events like UW-Madison's annual undergraduate research symposium. PAR differs in the fact that it has allowed for the student researchers to be elevated as field researchers whose thoughts are taken seriously at every step of the process. Additionally, as PAR researchers, there is the mutual relationship where we, as the students, have the ability and level of trust where we are constantly challenging one another, our levels of thinking, and our different lenses as it comes to research. In this space, our life experiences are intertwined and wrapped in this project. Most students only get an experience where they're involved in every part of the process once they reach graduate school. As such, students can gain invaluable skills like communication, leadership, critical thinking, writing, among others, that prepare them for post-graduation opportunities like graduate school, post-graduation jobs, research lab positions, and more. Later in this presentation, some of the other researchers will share more regarding the impact of participating in the CBPAR project. Lisa will now share about how CBPAR can be used as a methodology for decolonizing academic research. So how are we as Pandal researchers decolonizing um, research methodology with CBPAR? First and foremost, to understand how we can decolonize research methodologies, it's uh, important to understand how research has historically harmed us. Research uh, as a colonial process um, often invites Hmong participants to speak on our pain, making us relive our traumas. They are then retranslated in ways that is palatable for the colonizing audience at the expense of our own trauma. We find that the results of the research done on our people are always deficit narratives that paint Hmong people as backwards and as the problem. Research, research uses refugee victim stories to reduce us into poor or helpless people and give solutions from colonized perspectives that don't actually recognize what our communities know we need. This harm shows up in narratives that blame Hmong people, families, cultures, traditions, etc. instead of recognizing how systems of oppression like white supremacy and colonialism create our conditions. So um, CBPAR, on the other hand, recognizes this invasiveness and harm that research does through a concept of decolonizing research which is recognizing the ethical, epistemological, and political commitments and responsibilities that our research has to uh, our community, as well as challenging academic traditions. This is the power in CBPAR by having our community impacted by the research decide what and how our stories are told and with the needs of our community in mind. As Hmong undergraduate students, we are the community and we are the researchers. We know our needs and our stories the best, and we must write ourselves in ways that don't paint us in harmful um, colonial narratives. So what does CBPAR look like in our research uh, particularly? We as Hmong students are in every process of the research. Uh, and we pay real close attention to the methods uh, because it is integral for the integrity of our participants' voices. Being Hmong students at UW-Madison, we believe the qualitative methods such as the interviews and the observations can best honor our uh, voices. Our research this year specifically included Hmong stopouts and alumni in our interviewing pool. Uh, most people know this identity stopout as dropout, um, but we call the uh, dropouts stopouts because we know that both uh, stopouts and alumni are part of this group or, or part of these groups that paint this narrative, blaming Hmong students for leaving and not succeeding. When the community is involved, we carefully create questions that matter and will honor our community stories. We make sure that the Hmong interviewers uh, are doing uh, interviews with other Hmong participants. Uh, when we do participant observations or uh, observations in general, we make sure that even our own feelings while being there are taken into account for. For example, when I was doing a observation on someone speaking on their dissertation about Hmong youth's feelings on Hmong language, I also added in what being that space made me feel. Um, and she was dis discussing things on how like, um, the genocide of Hmong language in schools is something that is devious and subtle. As a Hmong woman who can speak Hmong well, she still 
felt love and sadness for her uh, for Hmong children that she was interviewing. And it was really personal for her to talk about how colonialism violently impacted um, Hmong children in school. As a Hmong student um, and a Hmong researcher, I was reacting and with sadness and feelings of not being heard. So I believe that it was really important to document what we as researchers in the spaces that we are researching on are also feeling um, because um, our own voices are important to note because research is personal to us. And lastly, when our community is involved, we can decide how the results will support the participants and not enact recommendations that will re-traumatize and re-harm Hmong people. All of these examples in our research methods are how we use community-based participatory action research to really disrupt these narratives and use research to actually honor our community members' voices. Uh, when we can do so, our lived experiences of our pain are not used as tools to shame us, but rather to confront colonized narratives and recommendations. Our next section will be um, talking more about um, how CBPAR has been transformational for us as student researchers and um, just like the impacts of PAR in general. So uh, as both the researchers and participants in this project, um, the CBPAR project, we have the opportunity to engage in autoethnography, auto which is a methodology in qualitative research, um, where researchers use self-reflection and writing to explore their personal experiences. Um, it is an analysis where we acknowledge our positionalities as a starting point for examining and representing phenomena relevant to the research. So engaging in autoethnography, uh, we are able to connect uh, our stories to wider cultural, political, and social meanings, such that there are recognizable patterns that um, show up in our experiences. So furthermore, using autoethnography, um, it highlights other ways of knowing. It legitimizes personal experiences as valuable knowledge, which pushes back on the idea that knowledge can only be created through facts and cannot be influenced by personal feelings and beliefs. So it aligns with the intentions of doing CBPAR work because the intention is to center the community voices and their stories. Um, therefore, we keep an autoethnographic journal to document how participating in this um, project has been personally transformative and eye-opening for us. Um, among our journal entries, the reflections often like encompass positions of vulnerability, raw emotions, and the forming of the personal as political. And this process allows us to have um, important discussions and build trust within the team. So from the Bandao team uh, stories that we will be sharing shortly, it is evident that our participation in CBPAR fosters our growing critical consciousness and that documenting through autoethnographic auto journals is only a sliver of data that tracks these moments. So as both researchers and HMESC members, one area that we've seen CBPAR have a tremendous influence on is the work that we do as activists. So for four years, while our committee urged university faculty and administrators to productively support the growth of Hmong American studies at UW-Madison, the general responses we got from them were concerns, suggestions to talk to other people, empty promises, and verbal support. Though our demands and arguments were compelling, there seemed to never really be a sense of urgency in what we were asking for. Then, through CBPAR, we were able to work directly with the campus Hmong community as part of the community ourselves and form a stronger voice for Hmong American students. Last year, CBPAR allowed us to gather the evidence of the needs of 10% of Hmong American undergraduates at UW-Madison. Um, and we found that Hmong student needs included better education on Hmong American history and experiences, more Hmong American staff and faculty, and spaces that are intentionally inclusive of Hmong Americans on campus. After we presented our evidence for these needs to the university, there was then a, a valid sense of urgency to respond productively to our demands as HMASC. Not only did CBPAR provide evidence of Hmong student needs and validate our demands as HMASC, our research spoke to other students of color by also validating their voices, struggles, and needs. People of color often have their truths and experiences questioned and invalidated. CBPAR is a way for people of color to have their voices and experiences heard and acknowledged. 
After we presented our research last year, we received a lot of support from home peers and other students of color. Many UW-Madison students reached out to us and told us that they share similar experiences with our participants. One notable encounter occurred after our team was invited to talk to a class that teaches about CV PAR. Two Black American students came up to us and talked about how they experienced similar feelings of exclusion, just like our participants. They told us that they conducted a similar research project with their community, but they didn't have any lead researchers to help them. So of course, there were many limitations as to what they could do due to funding and limited resources. But having students of color reach out to us and having these conversations show that our project goes beyond the Hmong community. Our research project validates not only Hmong student experiences, but other students of color as well. This is alarming because it shows that there's a common systemic pattern of exclusion that students of color are experiencing. To combat exclusion, Hmong students and students of color are finding institutional ways to validate their truths and experiences. These institutional routes, such as research, not only validate students of color, but also helps them gain institutional visibility. Um, so while doing research, we found that Hmong American students face issues of institutional invisibility, meaning their experiences are not often known or being acknowledged institutionally. Considering that Hmong Americans make up the largest Asian American population in Wisconsin, it's surprising to know that Hmong Americans only represent about 10% of the Asian student population here at UW-Madison. On top of that, you would think with such a large presence that there would be more curriculum focus around the topic of Hmong. However, we found out that there are only primarily two Asian American studies courses that focus on Hmong, along with uh, the Hmong language courses. Even within the university's statistical data, Hmong Americans re uh, remain invisible for quite a long time. In fact, we discovered that Hmong Americans were described by the university as a targeted minority and therefore were grouped in with other uh, students under the title of Southeast Asian, which includes Vietnamese, Laotian, Cambodian, etc. It wasn't until 2006 uh, that when the university first decided to add Hmong as a self identifying ethnic category in their admissions application. Even so, the data that are collected don't often get reported and or aren't readily available for public viewing. However, through the work of CD PAR, we have been able to push back on some of those narratives of institutional invisibility. CD PAR not only validates the voices of Hmong American students, but it also challenges institutions to be more transparent with their data. After our presentation last spring, uh, the university, the UW systems, and the Wisconsin Tech Colleges all reacted to our call for more disaggregated data. In response, the UW system was able to provide our team with compiled statistics of all Hmong students attending UW schools since 2009. Furthermore, we also generated talks within the Diversity and Inclusion, Inclusion Committee of Wisconsin Tech Colleges who were supportive of the idea to better collect data on their Hmong students. Of course, with this exposure, we also received some backlashes from individuals within our institution. After the release of our brief report, we were faced with, uh, well, how do I put this? Uh, we were faced with some sort of institutional defensiveness, and in some ways, they were trying to justify why the numbers appear the way they are. However, they only further expose the issues of data collections at this institution. Now, even though our university didn't see any use for our report, it was pleasant to hear that Dr. Kong Peng Pa of UW Eau Claire's uh, decided to use our report as a tool to further advocate for their Hmong, uh, critical, critical Hmong studies program, showing that this uh, project such as this has impact beyond local institutions and communities. So I've spoken about the institutional impact that PAR can have. Yang will now speak about the individual impact that PAR has. Yeah, so um, CB PAR has been transformational for me personally. Um, and to kind of backtrack um, from an early entry in my autoethnographic uh, journal, I shared um, some of my initial feelings about research in general and how PAR has shifted some of those views um, so as an undergraduate, I didn't get the opportunity to be involved in uh, research projects, uh, nor work with uh, faculty researchers. Uh, my program in uh, human development and family studies promoted more 
uh, field experiences, such as like in internships and externships. Um, nonetheless, it was still hard trying to find like a faculty who would share similar research interests and um, uh, fit as a potential mentor. So I was like feeling hopeless about getting any type of research experience near the end of my undergraduate career um, that I actually, I think I stopped looking for it like completely, like it wasn't even part of my agenda. Um, so in this entry, I wrote um, scientific method of knowledge is part of an agenda that delegitimizes other cultural ways of knowing. I resisted the idea of getting involved in research for most of my undergrad years because I felt stuck by the system. I was in a trance of, can I truly be free of the system? Can I truly decolonize and unlearn at the same time as contributing back to the system? So this was me thinking about how I felt as if doing research would not be enough and that at the end of the day, um, the face of the, of the UW still gets recognized by the work I do without actually helping and advocating for the issues I am concerned about. And then here is what I wrote in regards to actually choosing and desiring to be involved with research uh, when I got into graduate school. Um, especially getting involved with the Pandal research team and after hearing about their CV PAR work the year before. Um, so while doing research, I want to be intentional with my work, but also mindful about what I put out there. Is this for the better or will it cause more harm? I want to be mindful of the diversity and complexity of each Hmong individual. Therefore, also be open-minded to the different experiences we each face, as well as how unique narratives bind our stories together. So I guess like I kind of began to like shift a mindset of doubting myself and my work to becoming more hopeful and open to research, uh, mainly because I see the importance of CVPAR and that my research will do more than put words on papers. Um, not just that, but being part of this project has like given me the skill sets to feel confident around advocacy work and overall participation in civic engagement. Um, this is just a small piece of how CVPAR has been transformational to me. Um, but my colleague, Lisa, will share a powerful piece on how CVPAR has impacted her individually as she weaves together more American student narratives. Thank you, Ying. Um, so I'm going to talk about my uh, journey during this research and how it has changed me. Um, and I'm going to read an excerpt from my journal that talks about my experiences here at UW-Madison. Um, and I speak about on connecting my sister's story to mine to uh, and how it had, has helped my journey here, eventually leading me to be able to name how higher education has also harmed me. So this is the excerpt from my autoethnographical journal. Bailey and Matt just asked if I would like to find a quote from my sister's interview on her experience with engineering. And when I was rereading her interview, I realized that I didn't do a reflection, but I had so many emotions and things to say that can't be written down on one page. For one, I am super proud of her. She's one of the most powerful people that I know to have come to understand that what has happened to her is not her fault. I also feel a little guilt because I was one of the people who did not understand her decision for leaving. She felt judgment and assumptions of her being lazy from us. Coming to college, I actually understand the forces that pushed her out. It was the institutional racism accumulating in so many ways, like this facade of productivity culture and colorblindness and so much more that led to her spiral into exhaustion. The interview I did with another Madison graduate who graduated in biology made me think that her story is not that different from my sister's. They both were miserable here and faced a lot of messed up situations. I really thought I would be hearing two different narratives with graduates and stopouts, but both people were suffering. Whether people are stopouts or graduates, the experience here is a heartbreaking one. People are not forgiving enough to us when we often don't create the conditions we are in. Um, that is what I'm learning when I'm doing these interviews. I also feel like most of the people on this campus, including students of color, want this success narrative and are willing to throw um, our own people under the bus to make ourselves seem more elite, more better, um, or whatever. But are we any better because we stay? And that's the part that makes me the most maddest. I don't want the university to use my body to throw shots at my community members that are not in college or that leave this institution just to gas my ego. I knew for a fact that I would not allow them to use my face nor my story as one of the university's successes. My community are the folks that are not here too, and they deserve better than to be pitted against me. 
and the university would not use me to kill our spirits. So that was one of the excerpts from my journal. Um, and I think for me throughout my time here at UW Madison, I have always been trying to be a good student. Um, but through my entire experience here, I'm realizing that the school and higher education was not built with my livelihood in mind. Um, and I'm truly understanding now what my sister meant when she said she would be in a completely different place if she was taught to name her oppression, given the space to not be shamed for someone who um, stopped out and to feel empowered to confront the institution in ways it harms her. Because I have her story, I can name the violence I am experiencing on this campus. Um, and I feel like if I did not have this knowledge, I would be shaming myself. Um, leading to become uh, in the same situation that she is or blaming people for not working hard enough. Um, and this is uh, one way that I've built critical consciousness during this process uh, for myself. Now that I know um, what this looks like, I make it my goal to uh, not be a diversity photo op for UW-Madison. Um, I advocate for more spaces where most students can learn about colonialism, white supremacy, capitalism, anti-blackness, and patriarchy. Um, I make sure to be in roles that can support students on critical consciousness so they aren't blaming themselves or their communities. And this was looking like me trying to fill in roles as like a house fellow for uh, multicultural spaces and making sure that the students that come in don't blame themselves. Um, so this research has changed me as an individual um, significantly. Um, and Odyssey, on the other hand, he's going to introduce how building critical consciousness does not just happen to us as individuals, but to us as researchers as well. So in order to honor the stories of our participants in this research as humanizing as possible, we as researchers and students had to continuously develop our own critical consciousness by understanding our own positionalities within this project. For example, as college students, we are in a position that many of our peers, family members, and community members never held. We are in a privileged space that has allowed us to have the necessary tools and academic knowledge to analyze the world we live in. With all this in mind, we realized that we all had a special responsibility with this research. Each of us had the tools and abilities to initiate conversations with individuals on sensitive topics regarding their personal life, family life, uh, family life, um, physical and mental stresses, institutional racism, all of which they may have never shared with anyone else. In the end, we all made sure to recognize our own biases when conducting interviews and collecting these narratives. And, and with that, it also entails that we are not the ones sharing these people's stories. In fact, we are simply just giving these stories the opportunity to be heard. And when reflecting on our own positionalities, I myself realized my position as the only male researcher on this team, not only how it affects uh, interviews, but also how it affects uh, the research as a whole. Um, every meeting we had this past year has been a constant learning experience for me. I realized that I may exhibit various forms of toxic masculinity on a daily basis, and I had to keep that in check. And over time while doing research, it became apparent to me that not every space I enter was for me. This is all challenging, and I had to learn and reflect on my decisions. However, I did realize that my privilege as a Hmong man were also needed in some cases. For example, midway through our data collection phase, a lot of my female colleagues were stating that they were having issues finding male participants. Me, on the hand, didn't seem to have any of those issues at all. Then it quickly dawned on me that it was because of my male identity that it was that was possibly why I was able to find more male participants than my female colleagues. It was quite shocking to think at first, uh, but it also became a crucial learning point for me. It helped me realize that my behavior was different when I collected or conducted interviews with uh, different genders. For example, with my male participants, I could relate more to their experience and sympathize with their struggles. This led to more comfortable settings for both of us and in, uh, in some cases, more in-depth uh, discussions. 
However, with my female participants, it wasn't really the same. Although I could empathize with their experience, I didn't really follow up with them on topics as much. And it wasn't until reading over the, their transcripts that I thought, we should have talked about this more, or why, didn't that, why did I gloss over this detail? In the end, I think knowing my potential limitations helped me provoke better conversations later on, and it did help me realize that my male identity can be a positive in this research. And like with all our participants who are current students and alumni, we made sure to humanize the experiences of stopouts and transfers respectfully as possible. Although we didn't exactly meet our target number of the few participants we did manage to collect narratives from, we found that they provided us with some of the most compelling and crucial experiences. All their stories gave us a much better understanding as to what happens here at this institution that pushes students out. With that in mind, we wanted to give these stories justice by not further contributing to the narratives of college dropouts. Instead, we shifted the narrative from why are Mo American students failing to how are institutions failing Mo American students? Lastly, if these experiences were told through any other lens or by anyone else, then they wouldn't do these narratives justice. As Hmong students, we are doing research with and on our Hmong peers who live the UW-Madison experience. Most researchers often speak through data as community outsiders, but with PAR, we gotten the rare experience to speak through our findings as community insiders. It would be misrepresented to have highly educated old white folks tell stories about our peers when we are the ones going through those exact same experiences and obstacles. We're succeeding and struggling through college just like our peers. Furthermore, PAR allows us to humanize research. We tend to think of research as something distant and almost robotic. We think of research with, uh, with systems without humanities. Research, ah, sorry. Research is often spoken through the narratives of quantified data, but our research comes from real life testimonies from our classmates, those who come before us, and those who come after. PAR allows us to work with and listen to the stories of our peers and share them in a humanizing manner. Ultimately, our research allows us to bring visibility to those struggles of our peers and in a way, it sheds light to the stories that have been invisible to the institution and or have been hidden behind numbers. Okay, so um, for this third section of the presentation, um, we'll provide a, an early overview of some of the findings from our most recent data. So we discuss um, the different factors and actors that impact Hmong American college students' trajectory through college and subsequently um, into the workforce. Um, we noted factors that seem to have an influence on students' discipline and program choices, um, their sense of belonging on campus, their job market preparation and readiness, and general educational success. So by success, we are referring to a dominant narrative of a linear college journey in which students achieve high grades, um, graduate college in four to five years, and obtain employment in a field related to their major shortly after graduating. So from our recent data, we argue that our evidence problematizes individualized decision-making models of educational choice that ignore um, important social, cultural, and institu institutional factors, which have significant consequences on students' uh, educational success. And so we documented these five factors uh, that influence their academic experiences and career trajectories, which include um, cultural and family expectations, gatekeeping, advising, professional cultures, and interpersonal support. So for our first factor, we found that many of our students, current and former, um, a large part to their college decision-making choices stemmed from the desire to meet the cultural and familial expectations that were put on them. This ranged from the overall desire to attend college to major plans. Cultural expectations are presented in forms such as pursuing higher education, being seen as the only way to succeed, and pursuing careers with tr traditional trajectories. This also came about through the majors and career decisions that students decided on, such as careers in the medical field, the legal field, and other fields. Communities looked at these career paths as the sole indicators of success. 
Students were often worried that if they dropped out of school, this would go against their community and family's expectations and thus disappoint their families. In family expectations, students described going to college because that was what their parents, siblings, and family members had wanted. They described wanting to succeed in school because of the struggles that their parents had gone through to come to this country and the struggles that they went through to ensure that they could attend college. One student, YP, stated that throughout his undergraduate years, he had decided to no longer pursue medical school. However, many years after, he told his interviewer that he was considering going back to medical school because he felt that he was a disappointment to his parents for not going to medical school as per his original plan. Furthermore, family expectations were so heavy on the students that many of our participants looked back and shared that if they had known more about the university system and UW-Madison, they would have not attended at all, despite their family's wishes. Another pathway is gatekeeping, which are institutional procedures in place to vet students' qualifications for academic programs and institutional resources. Um, there are specific procedures for students depending on their majors. For example, students have to apply to the business school and be accepted in order to major in one of their degrees. If students don't get accepted and they continue to pursue their desired major, this may extend the students' retention. Even if students change majors after being rejected, their retention may still be extended because they spend a semester or two taking courses or even retaking courses just to qualify or be considered for acceptance. After collecting data this year, we've noticed that many of our participants experience gatekeeping. One strong example is a nursing student that we interviewed named Rebecca. She applied to the nursing school, was rejected twice, and was finally accepted to the program on her third try. She just completed her first year of nursing school and has one more year to complete before she graduates. It's notable to mention that she has spent six years as an undergrad before graduating. Although many people can, can claim that gatekeeping could happen to anyone, not just Hong American students, it's also important to remember that more than half of our participants are first generation college students who are federal Pell Grant recipients. Many struggle navigating through higher education because they're usually the first ones in their families to experience college. And in college, they lack the advising needed to help guide them in the path that they desire. So our data shows that Hmong American students rely on advising from academic advisors, peers, professors, student support mentors, student organization leaders, and others to help guide their college decisions and growth of knowledge regarding their degree and career paths. Importantly, we also noticed that students' relationship with advisors who are Hmong or people of color is crucial for their routine because they feel more comfortable talking to them and sharing problems beyond academics. An important observation that we've made is, is that academic advising specifically seems to be unhelpful and sometimes even traumatizing for Hmong American students at UW-Madison. A common academic experience um, for or academic advising experience for Hmong students is being directed towards new educational and professional programs and new goals, um, which often made them feel unheard and unworthy of a specific plan or of higher education overall. One of our participants, who's named Lee, um, and whose quote is on the slide right now, told us about her harmful experience with her academic advisor. In their conversation, she addressed how hard she has worked, what circumstances made college hard for her, and her willingness to work harder. And as she demonstrates, her advisor responded by telling her to consider transferring out of UW-Madison and back to the area she left for her dream. In response to her advisor, she states, I have nothing to go back to at home because my parents don't think I'm going to be anything in life. This experience left her feeling unwanted at UW-Madison and like other students who had a bad experience with academic advising, she never went back for more advising and her academic performance suffered. This year we had the opportunity to focus on our participants' thoughts on how they conducted themselves in an academic and professional setting. From our data, we found that many of our participants expressed difficulties adjusting to these spaces. Specifically, they would express challenges of adjusting to spaces that were predominantly white spaces. This could be either a classroom setting, student orgs, professional, or, professional orgs, the local campus environment, and so forth. Most students express that these settings are often sometimes isolating and intimidating, 
as you can see from one of the quotes, one of our alumni participants expressed that during their time here as a student, they didn't really engage in the typical white college experience. This is in relation to the UW-Madison experience, which is often highlighted by going to football games, tailgating, partying, socializing on State Street, bar hopping, joining clubs, etc. They felt, though, because they couldn't relate to their white peers, then their experience must not also be part of the campus community. Another one of our participants expressed that being the only person of color in these spaces can often be intimidating, especially in the classroom setting. They said that because of this, they couldn't be their true self and had to filter out behaviors that they thought were inappropriate. Um, to wrap up our findings, the last factor that influenced our participants' academic experience and career trajectories is their interpersonal support network. This referred to the support from academic and support programs, student orgs, um, and co-ethnic peer groups that may have provided support and resources for students to persist and persevere through college um, and the social and academic obstacles that they faced. Our data showed that Hmong American students found the support mainly through peers, friends, and family. However, it did not restrict them to just those support systems. Others included support, some support programs such as the Center for Academic uh, Center of Excellence, Hmong orgs, and committees like the Hmong American Studies Committee, fellowships and religious affiliations like Asian American InterVarsity, uh, multicultural Greek life and upperclassmen mentorship founded through those communities and peers, as it did for Jane, um, her quote's also up on the slide, an alum we interviewed who expressed the inter interpersonal support that she gained from her community at home and companions on campus. She discussed about the shared struggles that they went through during her time in college and the importance of mentorship that she had from advisors and other professionals. In summary, our research question focuses on the social, cultural, and institutional factors that impacts the educational and career experiences of Hmong Americans at UW-Madison. Our preliminary findings indicate that key factors include cultural and family expectations, institutional gatekeeping, advisor encounter, advising encounters, and institutional cultures, interpersonal support networks that impacts students, providing resources and supports for Hmong American students, but also frustrating students' educational goals. Our research findings hold stories that have been traditionally left unknown to educational institutions. Our findings lead us to conclude that Hmong American students are in many ways rendered invisible at the institutional level. In efforts to minimize that institutional invisibility, our team engages in what we call counter-institutional invisibility work. This CBPAR-driven work is defined by the coupling of counter-storytelling from critical race theory and the action component of participatory action research in order to bring visibility to counter-narratives while also mobilizing action in response to them. At its core, counter-institutional visibility work interrogates and pushes back on the powers and structures to perpetuate the invisibility that underrepresented communities, such as Hmong American students, experience in institutions. Gathering and amplifying counter-narratives is what initiates this work. Counter-narratives are stories that deconstruct meritocracy and unravel oppressive mechanisms and processes. At the same time, content narratives are a call for action against the injustices and inequities that are presented. Therefore, counter-institutional invisibility work performs as a uniquely impactful call for systematic change and critically informs institutional policies. We find that counter-institutional visibility work is needed in educational institutions. Through this work, institutions could establish more inclusive educational policies and create better educational environments to enhance learning in K-12 and higher education. One of the most important impacts of counter-institutional invisibility work in education is its capacity to bring justice and recognition to the experiences of minoritized students that would otherwise stay muted, misrepresented, and overlooked. 
Additionally, this work also empowers students and even community members outside of this research to value their own voices, tell their own narratives, and advocate for themselves. Furthermore, through the CV Par part of this work, students are able to gain transferable skills that not only help them academically, but also prepares them for post-college opportunities. In addition to the impact that this work would have on educational environment, and as a result of the collaboration between communities and researchers, counter-institutional invisibility work could be innovative and useful outside of educational spaces. We find that this work would have the power to critically critique workplaces and create work environments that diminish biases and hinder professional growth, as well as unfair demands towards workers. It is our hope that the importance of counter-institutional invisibility work continues to be communicated. We find that this work needs to be further explored and built upon because of its potential to create systemic change. Counter-institutional invisibility work goes beyond research. Our research is evidence that counter-institutional invisibility work is a very useful approach to institutional oppression that garners attention and results in action. Additionally, our research shows promise in CVPAR approaches to reforming higher education. As a result of our first study and after sharing our proposed methods of action, we received a lot of media attention and held several conversations with different people in power. We were invited to the state capitol twice to talk about our research to two different state legislators that represents districts with large concentrations of Hmong Americans. Furthermore, HMASC members had a critical conversation with the Asian American Studies program, which led to the establishment of a Hmong American Studies emphasis under their certificate. Throughout this process, HMASC members had an active role in choosing specific courses that would count towards the emphasis. This emphasis may not meet HMASC's goal of creating a Hmong American Studies program, but it's a good stepping stone to show the university that there is a growing interest in Hmong studies and that it is important to include our narratives and curriculum. HMASC's relationship with the Asian American Studies program allowed us to center programming around Hmong student needs and advocate for Hmong studies. Two of us served on their student hiring committee in their search for a faculty associate. We've also presented our research to the Association of Asian American Studies, where we got to network with different Asian American scholars. And we've held an event with the Multicultural Student Center for a PETA month to reconnect with the student body. HMASC was re-endorsed by the Associated Students of Madison, which is UW-Madison student government. And our research won the 2019 Amy Lane Yellow Lights Award for Creative Endeavors. Counter-institutional invisibility work must be a continuous effort. Our team continues to do counter-institutional invisibility work through research, publishing, presenting, networking, and advocating. Yeah, as I, so um, as I was uh, listening to the students, uh, I was thinking back uh, to uh, a couple of years ago when we first, uh, when Bailey and I first met this group of, of compelling students and, and just how far we've come um, and uh, and what value they've uh, you know brought to this project, um, and you know so I wanted to end up by uh, uh, end up our presentation by discussing some of our our plans for the future. Though uh, one of the general points that we wanted to demonstrate through our presentation of the Panthao study uh, is that college student led CB PAR work uh, is an innovative approach to higher education policy studies. Uh, it, it's, a, it's innovative, we think, because it centers the experiences and insights of students of color and provides evidence and theory to inform policy change and student advocacy. Briefly, uh, I wanted to share our, our team's plans uh, to demonstrate and promote the value of this approach uh, through our future dissemination, um, uh, follow-up research, and the potential scaling of this method. Um, First, um, as you've seen, we're fortunate now uh, to have a very large amount of extremely rich qualitative data. Uh, uh, all this data has been coded in MaxQDA uh, qualitative analysis software, so it's ready for uh, analysis and dissemination. Uh, we have two kind of big plans for this. Uh, um, first, as part of this process of counter-institutional invisibility work, we plan a series of brief reports to communicate findings to higher education administrators and policymakers and to support the student advocacy work. Um, for example, we're currently working on a report uh, uh, on, this, on the student level impacts of Hmong studies coursework for Hmong American students at UW-Madison. 
Um, student activists will be able to use this um, report to advocate to maintain and expand the funding of the curriculum during the coming budget cuts following the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we also plan academic pol publications to develop and theorize this method, the college student-led CBPAR uh, work, um, as a critical approach to higher education policy studies. Um, in terms of the expansion of the Pontau study, our team is very well positioned to, to conduct follow-up research with our large sample of Hmong American students uh, as they continue their education and transition into the workforce. Um, this is going to provide very rich detail about how this group of minoritized college students manages the college workforce transition. Um, following this, uh, the, or I'm sorry, um, this follow-up is also going to include interviews to document the impacts of, of the uh, recent historical events uh, that are transforming the economy and society in the U.S. Uh, these include, of course, the pandemic, uh, as well as the recent rise in anti-racist activism and civil unrest in our country. Um, thus, our longitudinal follow-up for the Puntao study will investigate how the factors influencing the education and career success of students of color change over time, and how students of color are navigating recent social, economic, health and political factors as they move through college and transition into careers. Lastly, we're currently exploring and discussing several potential methods to scale the use of college student-led CBPAR by training and mentoring graduate students and scholars in the methodology as they, um, so that they can start their own college student-led research teams, like similar to the Panthao team. Um, one idea we have is to develop and implement a clinical uh, a clinical practicum at UW Madison for graduate students to engage in with this research literature to gain practical experience supporting the three ongoing CBPAR projects at CCWT, and then develop their own proposals uh, to um, you know perhaps for their dissertations, for example, uh, to conduct college student led CBPAR projects. Second uh, idea that we have is a week long summer institute for graduate students and junior scholars from around the country. This institute could be similar uh, or perhaps a condensed version of the clinical practicum uh, with the goal of training participants to be ready to return to their own universities uh, with a plan to conduct a college student led CBPAR study. Um, and finally, um, uh, we'd like to host a small conference at UW Madison after the first round of the clinical practicum in the summer institute. Um, so that participants can present their research, receive feedback, and so that we can continue to expand um, and build upon a national network of higher education CBPAR scholars and teams.